want to talk about this report in The Lancet regarding the pursuit of a vaccine to prevent COVID-19, and it regards the Russian vaccine. To help us understand all of these issues and some of the breaking news, we invite into the stream Dr. Cindy Prinz, University of Florida Associate Professor of Epidemiology. Also, Angelique Kemlani is joining us. She is the reporter who covers coronavirus and health issues here at Yahoo Finance. Let's start with that Lancet report. Dr. Prinz, it, it, it's basically saying the Russian vaccine showed no ill side effects in 76 people. What does that really mean? Should we discard this information? Should we trust it? Well, I think you have to be really cautious about information like that. Um, you know, 76 people is, is not a large amount of people to really be able to assess properly whether there are going to be side effects when a vaccine gets rolled out in a larger population. So I would definitely um, look at that with a lot of caution. Doctor, I just want to detour over here and just say go Gators as a, a Gator alum here. Um, but okay. more, more, <laughs> more seriously, um, looking at these results, though, I, it seems like uh, they kind of mirror the preclinical results of AstraZeneca's is what I've been hearing um, in terms of the antibody response and the level of response. And that the expectation is largely that uh, uh, vaccines like the Russian one are going to be less effective than some that come later. And they're expected to not really provide prevent transmission as much. So with that in mind, do we have, you know, sort of any understanding of if the Russian vaccine is actually on par and could meet minimum FDA criteria? That one, I don't know yet. I think that it's a little too soon to tell. There are a lot of different types of vaccines that are being worked on right now. And um, certainly what we're seeing early on may not wind up being the most effective vaccines that come later on down the line. And so, again, I think, you know, we're going to see some things early and some things that may show some efficacy um, and that can be, you know, potentially authorized for use. And then later on, we may see trials that are more effective, vaccines that are more effective, and those may be what winds up being more widely rolled out. Dr. Prince, Dan Roberts here. Uh, if I can just zoom out and ask you a logistics question, when we talk about a vaccine, uh, everyone is acting as though, well, once we have a vaccine, that's it. Great. It's safe to, to come out and it's all over. But I mean, how would it really get to everyone on a mass scale quickly? You know, when we talk about getting a flu shot, I mean, A, it's sort of optional and a lot of people just don't do it. Obviously, this would be very different. But it, it seems to me a lot of people are underestimating uh, the simplicity of getting it to a large number of people right away, even once there is a vaccine. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about the U.S. population alone, we're talking about over 300 million people. Um, and, you know, obviously not everyone is going to opt to be vaccinated, but we need a large proportion of the population to get vaccinated. Each of these vaccines is going to have um, different requirements as well. So there are different storage requirements. If you're looking at the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines right now that that um you know, they're proposing maybe ready this fall. One of them needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius, one at minus 20. Um, so those are, you know, specific storage requirements and not everyone may have the ability to do that, especially minus 70. And then beyond that, yeah, just the logistics of, you know, how do you roll this out? How do you track that everyone is getting not just the first dose, but you need a second dose of a lot of these vaccines for people? And so, you know, we really um, are going to have to think about how this will get distributed. And, you know, some of those plans are being put in place now, but it's going to be um, logistically challenging. On the logistics, one of the key things I think is that the focus is largely on the U.S. Uh, when it comes to these vaccines that are being being developed here. Uh, but meanwhile, the Russian vaccine is uh, freeze dried or can be freeze dried, and so that sort of removes that need to freeze it and the the extra requirements there for freezers and etc. Um, how does that play out? While we've seen you know the U.S. swat away uh, efforts to join the World Health Organization and their uh, vaccine race, uh, could we see others like Russia? Russia, China, et cetera, sort of dominate the global market while we're focused here? Absolutely, because what people need to understand is that in certain areas of the world, you still are not going to be able to distribute a vaccine that has refrigeration requirements because of the time it takes to get to some people and the time that it would take that, you know, the vaccine would be potentially outside of its required storage. Um, you really do need some of these options like the freeze-dried vaccines, vaccines that are going to be stable 
at room temperature or even can travel in areas where they may be exposed to heat and then can be reconstituted and then given to people. So that's really critical. A lot of our, our world lives in areas where it's not going to be easy to get um, sort of a, a vaccine that has um, severe refrigeration requirements to them. Doctor, I wonder what you make of the dual messaging that's going to be coming from the scientific community in the political side of things, uh, particularly as it relates to the timeline of a vaccine in the U.S. Yesterday, we heard from the chief scientific advisor of the Operation Warp Speed saying essentially that deadline that's been floated by the White House of an October vaccine is very, very unlikely in his words. So uh, I'm curious what you see as the timeline right now. And you know, more importantly, we've seen the market move in so many directions on these headlines. Lines. How are those of us who are not privy to the science, how should we be reading the headlines? Sure. I mean, I think that there has to be an understanding that these take these clinical trials take time. And these companies that um, the U.S. is saying, you know, might have vaccines ready by fall, by October, by November, they're in phase three, but, you know, they haven't completed that process yet. And so this is potentially an ideal timeline if everything were to go perfectly for them. I think that, you know, maybe there's a potential for an emergency use authorization for the vaccines. But in reality, this would be even if that happened, a very low number of doses, um, it wouldn't be something that would be widespread for the population. And so, you know, for, for vaccines as a whole, we're really looking at rollouts, I think, more into the springtime. Um, and of course, then adding on the logistics of that distribution, that's going to take time as well. And so when people are reading this, I think you have to understand that, you know, Everyone wants there to be a vaccine. Everyone wants this to go away. But in reality, science takes time and, um, you know, it can't be rushed either. It's important that this is done correctly. OK, Dr. Cindy Prins is University of Florida Associate Professor of Epidemiology. Good to have you here on The Move.